They are all right. related to Google Calendar. <laughs> Frank says a proposal is due in a week. It's due in a week. Nothing can be done. Right yeah, yeah. If you have to work on it in a, a resort in Mexico, I guess you you have to, right? Yeah, we're in the DOE. I think we work at home. <laughs> All right. We usually start. Uh, we're in the COVID era, but we start at least maybe four or five minutes uh, later. We see the number rising rapidly in the first couple of minutes. So we'll hang on just a moment or two. Yeah, fantastic. It's good to see Maurice today. How are you, sir? Hi. Good. Hang in there. Keeping busy. Yeah. yeah. Pass this talk. Cool. Looks really interesting. I'm glad to hear. Good talk. Ask questions. Guten Tag, Christian Junger. <laughs> Guten Tag. <laughs> Wie geht's dir? Yeah, everything's good. good. That's good. <laughs> That's good. I have to improve my German. My kids have gotten very good at it. And there's no way I can keep up with them. There was when they were sort of in the various stages, they made me read the, you know, the German lines to practice with them in this oral stuff. And you know, I was okay in the beginning, but now they are much infinitely better than anything I can do. So I you gotta teach me, Christian. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> it was a time I was reasonably good at it. What's your background, Irfan? You're in a tiny screen, so I can't see it. Uh... Oh, uh, this is uh, the China cabinet in my dining room. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm usually sitting outside <clears throat> or uh, you know, in my sunroom, but it's, it's gotten colder, although today is nice, right? But still, somehow, I, I'm lagging behind as a phase uh, shift as an inductive element, Kevin, you know, reactive element. <laughs> I do, I do. <laughs> Actually, even even signing in and seeing that it's it doesn't appear to be dark out in some some people's backgrounds it's honestly a little disorienting because it's it's already you know night night here i think i've also gotten soft at 64 degrees and i'm like ah, it's kind of cold i'm not gonna go out today <laughs> yeah oh my god Irfan, it's been 64 degrees in my house for like four months now <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry man that's what happens to human beings right they get used to easy stuff I must say that, you know, I, I get invited to go to East Coast conferences and stuff in the wintertime. I don't go anymore. <laughs> I, I sort of think twice. If it's MIT, I'll go, Kevin. But, you know, other times, um, especially in Europe, you know, in Northern Europe, I've been invited, uh, Christian, to, uh, you know, Helsinki or whatever. I'm like, there's no way I'm going. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I think this audience covers something like 11 time zones. So we have a good sampling of. <laughs> That's right. I grew up in New York City. I'm used to this stuff. I hate shoveling it. I mean, the, I, I like the white snow, but you know, when the bulldozer sort of you know plows your driveway every two hours, right? This is sort of irritating. And and when it turns sort of gray black for like three months, that's you know in the middle part of the city. I, I never liked that. Vermont is cool. You see all the white stuff is great, but in the inner city, it's not so easy. Yeah, I feel like Boston it melts extremely quickly relative to my experience in the Midwest. It seems like after every snowstorm. There's a streak of hot weather that just gets rid of the snow. Yep. Uh, I think no complaints in the Bay Area. When I first came to the Bay Area, I'm like, man, this place is cold, right? You always need a jacket, so on and so forth. And I'm like, it's okay. <laughs> I can deal with this. All right. So I think we are approaching uh, time. It's five minutes in. So it is a distinct pleasure to have with us today Professor Kevin O'Brien, who did his undergraduate work at Purdue 
and then went on to complete his graduate and postdoctoral work at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, currently, he's a professor uh, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, in particular holds the E.E. E. Landsman CD chair uh, in electrical engineering computer science. So Kevin, welcome back. And we look forward to your talk entitled Approaching the Quantum Limits for Amplification and Isolation with Nonlinear Metamaterials. Over to you, Kevin. Thanks, Irfan. It's a, it's a huge pleasure to be uh, quote unquote back at Berkeley, albeit virtually. Um, I really, you know, treasured my grad school and postdoc experiences uh, here. Um, and along those lines, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about some of the, um, some of my background and um, the, the types of things I used to work on and how that leads into um, what, I, what my group is working on now. So in the past, I worked on um, nonlinear optics in optical metamaterials, basically light matter interactions in these engineered systems in which you can make electromagnetic properties that you normally don't see in the everyday world. For example, um, engineering uh, a metamaterial to have a zero or a negative index of a fraction. So the phase velocity is infinitely fast and what consequences that has on phase matching. Um, engineering the properties of nanoparticles so that you can enhance or suppress their nonlinearity and looking at uh, acousto uh, plasmonics in these, these nanoparticles. Um, and at some point I was actually a housemates with a, a student in the Siddiqui group and they were telling me, uh, Natanya was telling me about uh, these amazing uh, properties of, of, of circuit QED and um, some of the traveling wave systems, traveling wave amplifiers that they were working on making and um, how there were some, some challenges with these. And I thought, wow, this is, this is like a, a nonlinear metamaterial. And these are phase matching problems that uh, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with, with my, from my work in metamaterials. So I, uh, I started uh, working with Irfan's group as a PhD student. And we, uh, together, we realized this traveling wave parametric amplifier that's now one of the standard amplifiers for uh, superconducting qubit readout in the circuit QED architecture. Um, and then I joined the Siddiqui group as a postdoc uh, where I focused on engineering and fabricating uh, superconducting quantum processors, intentionally not working on nonlinear metamaterials just to get a, another flavor of, uh, of experience. And um, then in 2018, I moved to MIT as an assistant professor and um, I'm leading the quantum coherent electronics group. And here you can see the, uh, the members of the team uh, were a, a relatively small group, but were uh, growing quickly and aimed to reach steady state of around uh, 10 people. And the themes that we focus on are microwave quantum optics, engineering light matter interactions. From a, from a metamaterial perspective, uh, the circuit QED platform is really, it's an absolute dream because you can not only engineer the linear properties of these systems, but you can actually engineer the nonlinear Hamiltonian itself. And you can make a lot of really, really interesting um, devices and see some interesting physics. We also work on quantum metamaterials, uh, devices such as these traveling wave parametric amplifiers, and we're also interested in other uh, things needed for measurement like um, circulators, isolators, and photon detectors, some of which I'll talk about today. And we're also interested in designing and building superconducting quantum processors and understanding the EM and physics constraints on these. So the outline of the, the talk I'm gonna give you today is first I want to dig a little bit deeper into these traveling wave parametric amplifiers, these near quantum limited amplifiers, and ask the question, okay, these, these have achieved you know, very, very good performance, but they're not at the quantum limit. And we want to dig deep into the physics of these devices and see if um, it's possible for them to achieve quantum limited performance, uh, because it's, it's not a priori obvious because they're, they're these thousands of mode devices rather than the idealized parametric amplifier, which is just one, one physical mode. And then we're going to um, talk about a new design of a traveling wave parametric amplifier, which um, probably you can guess may have some impact on the previous uh, point. 
then I'm going to talk about a proposal that uh, we're putting on archives soon for a broadband traveling wave superconducting isolator uh, slash circulator. And then we're going to go into a little bit of interesting uh, physics on purely nonlinear couplers, uh, which can um, realize the ideal uh, James Cummings Hamiltonian. And I have a little, if you can see behind me, I have a little bit of a demo for you that hopefully we can get to. Okay, so looking at the audience, I see not everyone is in a is in front of a dilution refrigerator every every day. So I'll I'll go through and give a little bit of a motivation for um, why you want uh, high quantum efficiency amplifiers with an example from uh, daily life. So imagine you know instead of giving this talk, I was um, sitting in front of you uh, playing the guitar, and I wanted to transmit this this music to you. Um, I would uh, use a microphone like the one uh, in front of me. It would create an electrical signal as well as the Johnson uh, Nyquist noise, which is just black body radiation from the, the resistive components. Then you would amplify this with a preamp. You would have some amplified input noise, some added noise from the preamp. And then you would have a second uh, amplifier and, and analog to digital converter. And then you would pipe this, you, this digitized signal into Zoom, for example. Now, to get an idea of how this uh, situation is analogous to uh, superconducting qubit in circuit QED, imagine that your microwave is emitting single photon level signals. And your ADC and room temperature stage is 30,000 times hotter than the microphone. And this is uh, basically the, the, the situation we're in for superconducting qubit readout. Um, we're, now I'm drawing a qubit measurement chain where we have the qubit readout resonator. The readout power is on the order of minus 140 dBm at five gigahertz. Mixed in with this, you have thermal and, uh, thermal and vacuum fluctuations. You amplify these, your amplifier creates some added noise. You digitize it at the 4K, uh, you amplify it again at the 4K stage, digitize it and uh, plug this into your computer or uh, FPGA and do qubit state classification. So there are two major challenges with this. First, you want the amplifier to add a minimal amount of added noise. And you want this for fast high fidelity uh, measurements. And you're also, and this is in part because you're limited to single photon level microwave signals at the qubit. And this, this requires low insertion loss and an ultra low noise amplifier. And a second challenge is the thermal photons from these higher temperature stages. So if you plot the number of photons per mode, um, the average number of photons at the 10 millikelvin stage is 10 to the minus 11. At 4K, it's 16 photons on average. At 300 Kelvin, it's 1,000 photons per mode. So and the, the issue with this is that qubits are extremely sensitive to photons in the readout resonator. For example, for typical uh, readout resonator parameters, a coherence time T2 of 100 microseconds requires an average photon number of less than 0 0.002. Um, and the immediate next stage has 16 photons per mode, an n bar of 16. So this presents a huge problem with isolation. And right now, this is tackled in a typical, uh, a typical um, superconducting quantum computer using banks of circulators and isolators. For example, here's a, photo, uh, a photograph of the um, IBM Q uh, superconducting quantum computer. There, the, the fridge is something like a one meter by one meter by one meter uh, you know, cube slash cylinder. Um, and the quantum processor is comparatively tiny, a little one centimeter by one centimeter by a few hundred microns chip. And a lot of the other space, the rest of the space is taken up by circulators and isolators, which require strong magnetic fields to operate because they're based on um, the Faraday effect. And your quantum processor and your quantum limited amplifiers are very sensitive to stray magnetic fields. So, and because you have to shield these, um, you need um, things like mu metal, uh, cryoperm, um, superconducting shields. And this ends up take, making up the, the vast majority of the low temperature um, 
the equipment at the low temperature stage in one of these fridges. And to imagine scaling superconducting um, quantum computing up to uh, thousands, millions, thousands, tens of thousands, millions of qubits, we really need massive infrastructure improvements. We need you know, more ability to multiplex qubit measurements, which IBM, I would say, avoids more than most, more than, for example, one of the fridges at um, LBNL or Berkeley, where they use tupas and, um, and to help multiplex the measurements. In addition, we need non-magnetic isolators or circulators suitable for uh, in on-chip integration. So we can you know, make, make all of this, uh, we can get rid of these isolators and circulators, which make up a huge uh, volume fraction and mass and, also, and, and reduce the, um, the magnetic field shielding. And we also need cryogenic control hardware. So um, today I'm gonna be talking about the, um, the amplifier portion first. So there are two wow. basic, yeah. Sorry, did someone say something? I think it may be some straight noise. Okay, great, great. Okay, um, so there are two basic strategies for um, for implementing these amplifiers. There is a uh, lumped element approach um, where you have one spatial mode, one nonlinear LC oscillator, where you get the nonlinearity from the JJ. And you drive this with a pump field and use this as a parametric amplifier. And this has single or few spatial modes. It's relatively narrow band, but it has very well understood quantum efficiency, which I'll, I'll go over in the next slide. And the other approach is to use a traveling wave parametric amplifier, which involves thousands of spatial modes. And it can have a very wide bandwidth, uh, several gigahertz of bandwidth with a central frequency of gigahertz but it's still an open question whether they can actually reach the quantum limit because there are all of these modes and information may be leaking into places where you're not measuring. So first let's look at the case of the JPAs, the lumped element JPAs. So there was this really nice paper in 2017 that took a uh, deep look at JPAs and calculated um, including all the non-idealities, including these, these terms in the Hamiltonian you typically throw out, um, how, how these devices are actually going to behave. And they see that for weak pump powers relative to the, um, the, the coupling rate of this cavity set by this coupling capacitor, then you see near, near ideal performance in these uh, Wigner tomography plots. You see Gaussian behavior. And here they're looking at um, here they're looking at phase uh, sensitive amplification. But then as you turn up the pump power, you start to get this, um, this, this bending of this Gaussian behavior, which I, I believe they affectionately call the avocado plot. And um, this leads to non-ideal non amplifier performance. It leads to uh, a reduction in quantum efficiency and a distortion of the output fields. And if you, then plot the quantum efficiency uh, eta relative to the quantum limit, you find that for, they found that for a weak pump, so the green curves, you get essentially quantum limited performance. But then as you increase um, the strength of the pump, then you start to get deviations from the, the quantum limited performance at high gain. And um, just a little bit of uh, notation, we're referring to the quantum efficiency as uh, eta, and for an ideal phase preserving paramp in the high gain limit, eta is 0.5 by this definition. Um, and this corresponds to half a photon added to the um, input uh, signal per quadrature, um, where A is the, the case added photon number. And I should note that there are other conventions that, that treat um, the ideal phase preserving uh, paramp quantum efficiency with an eta of one for some very good quantum measurement reasons. But we'll use the amplifier convention where eta equals 0 0.5 in the high gain limit indicates a, a perfect quantum efficiency. And I should note that the current record for full chain measurement efficiency of 80% in a, is in a JPA, uh, albeit one that was integrated on, on chip. So just to summarize, uh, JPAs, 
have a very high quantum efficiency and the design parameters to achieve that are, are fairly well known, well understood. And those design parameters are a weak pump and a device that's strongly coupled to the environment. So a large, large capo. And on the one hand, these traveling wave parametric amplifiers, they operate in this large kappa limit because these aren't coupled to, these aren't forming a cavity at all. Each of these little unit cells, it's, it's, it's perfectly coupled to the environment. So you get this um, free flow of, of, of electromagnetic waves. But on the other hand, um, when you, you measure the quantum efficiency of these J-tupas, um, like in this uh, Berkeley uh, 2015 measurement, which found a uh, full chain quantum efficiency uh, of about 50% the quantum limit, of which 10% was attributed to dielectric loss and 17% was attributed to an um, unknown loss mechanism. And I think it's, uh, and the, it's this 17%, this uh, which is actually the larger portion of the um, non-ideality of the amplifier that, that I'm gonna be, um, we're going to be looking into today and trying to figure out um, what what it comes from and and what it um, and whether we can fix it. And I want to briefly comment that I think it's and I can't take credit for this uh, uh, you know measurement because this is an expertise uh, that, was, that was already in the lab. This uh, precise calibration, but you know, writing in a paper that you know this this loss exists. We have no idea where where it comes from. I think it's you know, this is the good part of science. It, it's kind of in contrast to um, the, the famous Millikan oil drop experiment where, um, you know, Feynman in his, uh, his, his famous Caltech lecture said that this is one of the deep shame points of physics where this, this original measurement was wrong and then it slowly drifted to the right value instead of people uh, correcting it right away. So anyway, so this 17% this unknown uh, loss mechanism. Let's let's try to figure out what this might be coming from. And if we dig into the literature on uh, traveling wave parametric amplifiers, we find that even as far back as the 60s, there it was known that there's an issue with these um, of sidebands. So not only do you have the ideal um, signal either interaction uh, mediated by the pump but you also have these spurious sidebands that you're generating, that you're coupling to, that you're, you can view it as you're, you're, you're sending information into these sidebands. And you can also view it as these sidebands are uh, coupling in noise from other frequencies. So um, I took a screenshot of the um, abstract of the paper and they say the effect of higher idler frequencies on the performance of the longitudinal beam parametric amplifiers previously been investigated. This purpose of the communication is to disclose a very general effect that higher idler components generated by the coupling between signal and pump wave may cause deterioration of the noise figure. And they find that A is the noise figure with this coupling and B is the noise figure without it. So this hints that there may be um, you know, rather fundamental issues with traveling wave parametric amplifiers. So, to investigate this, um, my students and I developed a multi-mode input-output model for a uh, J-tupa. And the way we did this was by, normally you, you can't, of course you can't consider uh, resistive effects or lossy effects in a quantum system, but you can consider these um, as couplings to an infinite transmission line. So we considered the 2,000 unit cell J-tupa, where we um, imagine 2,000 unit cells consisting of these JJs in series, capacitors to ground, uh, et cetera. And we considered for each uh, capacitor to ground, we consider this to be coupled to an infinite transmission line. And then we solved for the Hamiltonian and Lagrange of the system, uh, obtained the equations of motion. And then we solved this in the frequency domain, where we considered not just the signal and the idler, but an arbitrary number of sidebands. So you end up, um, so by, by doing this, you can get a rather complete description of the system, including the uh, quantum mechanical effects of loss on uh, quantum efficiency, as well as the effects of these signal and either sidebands. And if you, um, when you, when you do this as a discrete model, rather than a continuous 
rather when you treat it as a difference equation rather than a, a differential equation, then you can actually capture the effect of parameter variations as a function of position as well. So you know, when you actually fabricate these things, the components aren't all exactly the same. So using this type of model, we can, we can account for these effects. Um, but the effect of parameter variations is, a, is another story for another day. So the sidebands we're going to consider, we consider a, a signal mode omega zero. And the main process you often consider is coupling to a, uh, an idler mode. And you can consider this as a coupling separated in frequency by two omega p if you make the idler have a negative frequency. And not only do you have coupling to this mode, but you have coupling to all these other two omega p hops, all these other modes separated by two omega p hops. And if you drive the device harder, you actually get four omega p hops in, hops in frequency. And depending on whether you are uh, quote unquote hopping between a, um, a positive and a negative frequency mode or two positive and two negative frequency modes, this determines whether it's a frequency conversion process um, or a parametric amplification process. So we see that you know, th this, for example, is a parametric amplification process and this coupling to the omega one, omega zero and omega one um, is a frequency conversion process. Uh, but from the perspective of the model, it just it will, will calculate all, all of these processes. And maybe, maybe I, I won't talk so much about how we can fix this now, but you can imagine that you could in principle get rid of these sidebands by putting integrated filters into your um, amplifier in, for example, every unit cell of the amplifier. You can't do it at the two ends because this, um, this would just cause them to bounce back and forth and you would still get this quantum efficiency penalty. But you could imagine putting filters inside of every unit cell. But these filters, they have to span for multiple octaves. So, um, so, so they're really intense in terms of the component values and it's just not feasible in the end. You can reduce them to some extent by lowering the cutoff frequency of your transmission line, um, the, the point at which the propagation shifts from oscillatory to an exponential decay. But this has a, an expense of bandwidth. It, it, it increases the dispersion of your device and reduces your bandwidth. So let's, let's actually um, you know, take a typical tupa parameters and see what the impact of the sidebands uh, looks like. So in the left plot, I'm plotting the uh, gain for the signal and the relative power for all of the sidebands. So here we're injecting a signal on one end of the device. It initially has a gain of, of zero dBm, or dB, and all of the idlers and other components are, are zero as, as well. And then very rapidly, over the space of a few unit cells, you get all of these, you get not only the idler that you typically think about, the, the one that's symmetric about the pump, you also get a ton of, of other modes. For example, this um, higher order sideband A1, um, it grows even faster than the normal idler. And this causes, for example, your gain to be a little bit oscillatory at the beginning. And you get these propagating both in forward and backward directions, which impacts the stability of your device, it impacts the um, impedance matching, and it impacts the quantum efficiency. And we see that by the end of the device, these higher order sidebands are you know, really only maybe 10 or 15 dB below the signal. And this is really damaging in terms of quantum efficiency because you're, you're spreading out your information into these other channels that you're not measuring. Or you can view this as mixing in noise from these other channels. And just in general, the behavior is really complicated. We see all of these highly oscillatory modes, it's really complicated dynamics. And you know, when I look at this, I'm just like, wow, that, that, looks, that looks ugly. So then we can plot the noise contribution from each of these different processes where the red dashed line is, the, is quantum limited performance. And the quantum limit depends on the gain. That's why you see this behavior. But we see that in the high gain limit where the purple uh, horizontal line is the pump current uh, at which we plot these modes on the left. We see that the, um, 
we see that the, the side bands start to contribute um, like five to 10% uh, loss in the, um, in the, the, in terms of the quantum efficiency. And as you increase the pump current, the, uh, this loss mechanism starts to increase. So are you, are, are you taking questions now? I have a couple of questions yeah, about yeah, sure. some Go of the ahead. parameters. Okay. Um, so in, in optics, for instance, when you're generating frequency combs, you know, the carrier is very high frequency and then the sidebands are, you know, at the very small frequency offset away. Right, so could, right. you, could you give us a sense of, you know, what's the signal idler frequency separation? Um, yeah, like what's yeah. The, so here, what's the here side the... Band between versus carrier, et cetera? What are these scales? And how yeah, many so side here, bands will there here be? The, this signal frequency is say five gigahertz. Mm -hmm. And the pump frequency is um, typically also around order of five gigahertz. So it, it, of course, from device to device, it varies between say five and 10 gigahertz. But all of these are separated by twice the pump frequency. So for example, the next higher uh, sideband, if this is at five gigahertz, then this next one will be at 10 gigahertz, roughly. Um, or if this is at 10 gigahertz, the next one will be at, at 20 gigahertz. So it's, it's a relatively large frequency separation relative to uh, what you consider sidebands in typical nonlinear uh, frequency combs and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these sidebands are you know, really it, like it's, harmonics almost. Yeah, yeah well, they're, yeah. They, they're, they're centered. You can think of the signal and idler being centered around the pump frequency. And the sidebands are centered around like three times the pump frequency, five times the pump frequency, seven times the pump frequency. Thank you. Okay. So this looks like a, a really complicated system. And I want to mention that this is analogous to, this problem is analogous to uh, leakage outside of the computational subspace when you're driving low and harmonicity qubits like transmogs. So there you, you know, we, in the superconducting community, qubit community, we always say, oh, we're working with qubits, but of course these are actually highly multi-level systems. And when you drive them with short pulses, you can uh, send some of the population into these higher excited states. And um, if you then don't measure this, this population, then it will show up as a, as a loss. And this is similar to what's happening here. Kevin, just a quick question. Yeah. Uh, in this kind of analysis, this is assuming some kind of simple sinusoidal excitation, uh, nothing strange with S-noidal waves or C-noidal waves or anything like this. This is, this is assuming sinusoidal modulation, um, but with the, the effect of any like inhomogeneities in the transmission line on the pump. Like if you have you know, phase matching resonators every so many unit cells, your pump is going to some of your pump is going to bounce off these and it'll create something that's spatially modulated a little bit, but, mm -hmm. but it's roughly sinusoidal. Yeah. Nothing, nothing crazy with sinusoidal waves. Okay. Because of course in qubits, one can do all sorts of pulse shape engineering for, uh, for different things, but that's a different kind of anharmonic problem. <laughs> yeah. So, so actually, you know, we're, we're, we're getting to, to the, the solution to this and you'll see it has a lot of similarities to this pulse shaping in qubits, but now rather than temporal pulse shaping, we're going to be doing spatial pulse shaping of the pump. Okay, great. Okay, so a simple way to look at this system is to, um, to look at it in the Floquet mode basis. And this in this basis, um, you find that these are sort of like the, the eigenmodes of a time-dependent uh, Hamiltonian. And, um, and because the pump is, is creating this, uh, harmonic driving, if you, if you look at it in this traveling wave frame where it's moving at the speed of the pump, then you can find um, these, these two Floquet modes. One is amplifying, the other is de-amplifying, and all the rest aren't doing anything at all. Um, and this seems like the ideal basis to, to work in. If, if we could just get this amplifying and de-amplifying behavior, um, then if we could excite and if we could measure in this Floquet mode basis, then this would be really give us the ideal amplifier performance. But unfortunately, when you calculate the, uh, what these Floquet modes are, you find that they're 
they're composed of not just the signal and the idler, but they're composed of all of these other sidebands as well. So that would mean that you would have to, like, if you wanted to use this as a, an amplifier for qubit readout, you would have to have your, your qubit information, not just at the signal frequency, but at the signal frequency and all these other harmonics, all these other sidebands, which is just utterly impractical to even think about. Maybe you could do it as a proof of concept experiment, but it's just kind of crazy. Kevin, I may, I may have zoned out, and I apologize. Yeah. Can you say a few more words about what precisely you mean by Floquet modes and so on and so forth? Um, yeah, so if you, if you, um, you want to find, this is a, a, let me go back to this. So if we consider this system in the continuum limit, where you consider the pump just to be this sinusoidal wave, then the pump is interacting with this system by modulating the, the inductance of these Josephson junctions. And it's, and it's providing this modulation. It's, it's a periodic modulation of the properties of this Josephson junction. And that means that uh, Floquet theorem tells us that you can calculate the, um, this is sort of like a, a time, dependent, time dependent version of uh, Bloch's theorem, where you can describe the complete behavior of the system by describing its behavior over the course of one, one pump period, and then that, that profile multiplied by e to some characteristic exponent. And this exponent is called the Floquet exponent. So that means that we just have to solve for the behavior in this one, one pump period and then calculate these characteristic exponents, and then we can find the behavior um, anywhere else in the system. And this is this is like finding the um, for a for a, a a typical dynamical system. This is like finding the eigenmodes of the system, where these eigenmodes are some combination of the input states, and they'll just uh, grow or decay exponentially. Did that, does that answer your question? It does indeed. I think it's nice to think of this. You're solving in one Brillouin zone for the, uh, you know, sort of for the lattice vectors. Yeah, so yeah. It's it's like a Brillouin zone, but it's moving, which is, um, which is which is really a a general um, a general system that applies to a lot of other, um, a lot of other cases. Actually, I'm I'm trying to describe this. So this is all done numerically, um, finding the the Floquet modes by um, calculating the matrix describing the system. Um, and taking the the um, the matrix exponent of, of this, um, but I think you should be able to describe it analytically by looking at because you can actually map the behavior of a tupa into the solution to Matthews equations, and you should be able to get these these Floquet modes from that. But I, I haven't been able we haven't been able to figure out exactly how to do that mapping yet. Do you get the same Floquet modes, uh, Floquet mode solutions for different input states? So is this like a single mode amplifier or a multi-mode? Um, so this will have as many signal and idler uh, components as you're considering. You'll have that many Floquet modes, okay. but um, only two of them will do something interesting. So the so you only only one will amplify, one will deamplify. It's just depending on how many uh, signal and idler sidebands you consider they'll just be composed of more, um, more of these. And as you increase the size of your system, as you consider more and more um, uh, signal and either sidebands, you find that uh, the, the, the additional um, contributions, they, they drop off pretty quickly. So by considering like four or five, you can get a, a pretty complete description of the system. Okay. So this would be a great basis to work in, but the problem is that this, these Floquet modes can contain not just the signal and the idler, but they contain all of these other sidebands. So this, is, this green curve represents just the sum total of the, um, the, the weight of the, the, these sidebands in these uh, Floquet modes. And the, the weight depends on the pump current. So as you pump the device harder, your Floquet modes start to contain more, um, more sidebands relative, um, relative to the signal and idler. And our idea was that this is an ideal computational basis 
but it's composed of many frequencies. And our idea was that what if we use the JTUPA itself to generate these uh, Floquet modes? And our idea on how to do that was to use the adiabatic theorem to start off with a low pump power in which the Floquet modes just correspond to the, the linear modes of the system. They just, each Floquet mode morphs into one of the signal or I, signal idler or signal idler sidebands. And at low pump power, and then as you crank up the pump power, then it turns into one of these modes that can, is composed of um, all of these different uh, frequencies. So let's let's look at how this how this works in practice. So on the left, I've plotted the um, pump current as a function of position for a conventional J tupa. This is like the absolute value of the the pump current, um, not considering the sinusoidal behavior. And um, we, we see that it's a, a constant as a function position. Whereas in this Floquet mode scheme, we start the pump off at a very weak pump power. And here we just do it by, you know, kind of re reaching in and, and, and changing the, the, the parameters in the differential equation. But you could do this in an experiment by changing the um, critical current of your Josephson junction so, such that IP is constant everywhere, but you're changing the uh, junction critical current, so your pump is effectively weaker at the beginning of your device. And then you increase your pump current towards the center of the device and then ramp it down again. And very importantly, you have to change the phase mismatch such that it's always phase matched throughout this entire uh, transition. And if you do this, then you start off in a Floquet mode, but that Floquet mode is just the the single, the signal either or one of the sidebands. And then as you crank up the pump power, you adiabatically generate one of these really complicated messy Floquet modes. And then as you adiabatically crank down the pump power, you sort of you know, suck up or reabsorb all of these signal and idler sidebands. So you end up with just the signal or, or just the signal by the end of it. And this is a plot for injecting the signal in the Floquet mode case. In the conventional case, we see that when we inject the signal, as we saw previously, we get all these sidebands out. Here we don't. And this is when we inject an, one of the sidebands, we see that in the conventional case, the sideband, it couples to all the other modes and it actually creates some, um, it, it's actually amplified and it creates some, sig some uh, some noise at the signal frequency. So if you if you inject noise at these other frequencies, it gets amplified and translated over to the signal frequency. And this is one of the reasons why this conventional scheme has a reduced quantum efficiency. Whereas in this Floquet mode case, if we inject a sideband, we see that um, it stays in one of these non-amplifying Floquet modes. So it starts to get some signal idler but because we're ramping it up in this adiabatic fashion, it remains in one of these non-amplifying Floquet modes. Like it remains in one of these that just don't, doesn't do anything rather than being mixed in with one of, one of these. Whereas the signal and idler, they have this, uh, they, they are part of the, they're part of the amplifying uh, Floquet mode. And actually we see this discontinuity in the signal and idler uh, wave vectors as a function of, of pump current. Um, I think this is related to the hop bifurcation that you commonly see in parametric amplifiers. Okay, um, so this is you know really one of the figures that's a, at the heart of the scheme. So maybe I'll pause here for questions, um, if there are any, before looking in a little bit more detail about the quantum efficiency of these two different schemes. Um, any questions? Okay. So now we can calculate the gain in quantum efficiency as a function of frequency. Oh, uh, Kevin, maybe a quick question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So, uh, if you, you come back uh, to um, the model you use to describe the system, uh, so imagine you had like uh, n, n oscillators that were coupled. Mm -hmm. What I understood is that you described loss by um, basically the characteristic impedance of uh, that infinite circuit on the side. That's right. So can That's you right. Comment, what, what's the size of the matrix in the end? So, so if I, I, I'm a little bit confused about the size of the matrix, I guess. Yeah, so, so the matrix, you know, if you didn't do any tricks, the matrix would be uh, 2,000 unit cells times 
two times quantity two plus the number of frequency modes that you're considering. So it would be a matrix of size like 20, 20, 000, a 20,000 by 20,000 matrix. Um, but you can do some tricks where you can, um, when you're calculating this system, you can um, notice the form of this uh, from the perspective of a signal or idler entering. It just looks like, um, it, it just looks like a damping term. Um, so you don't actually have to consider the, the uh, behavior of this other transmission line. You can just replace it with a damping term. And then you can calculate the effect of each of these other ones um, in, a, in a separate calculation. So you're, you, get the, you end up with this set of um, 2,000 number of modes by number of modes you're considering. Like, like if you're considering five uh, signal either sidebands, you would have uh, a set of 2,000 uh, 10 by 10 matrices. And then you would just have to um, perform a bunch of ma matrix manipulations on these, basically calculating the, the discrete uh, Green's function for, for each of these inputs. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, and happy to talk about um, you know the model uh, offline or to send you a reference for the paper once it's uh, on archive. Should be soon. Okay. Okay. So now let's look at the gain in quantum efficiency as a function of frequency. So in the uh, brown curve, I plotted the tupa four, the the tupa that was measured that was very well characterized at at, at Berkeley. Um, parameters similar to this, uh, but without any uh, dielectric loss. And in the uh, orange curve, I plotted a, a tupa with a higher cutoff free, or a lower cutoff frequency of 50 gigahertz compared to the 70 to 75 gigahertz of tupa 4. And we see that this increases the quantum efficiency a little bit, as we expect. We're, we're reducing the bandwidth of the device and reducing the effect of these sidebands. But then if we look at the quantum efficiency of this floquet mode tupa in blue, we find that it has essentially ideal quantum efficiency. And we're talking like multiple nines of quantum efficiency um, uh, over a, a really broad bandwidth. And that's actually somewhat broader than the, um, the tupa four bandwidth. So it's essentially it, it, in the absence of dielectric loss, our model predicts it to have um, essentially quantum limited performance over, over more than an octave. So I think this is really exciting and, and it could provide a, a pretty amazing amplifier that could you know, change, uh, you know, change what we use amplifiers for rather than thinking of amplifiers in terms of, oh, it's only 75% quantum efficiency. I'll just have to, uh, have to live with this. We can think of it as I can really collect almost all the information that th that's coming out of this qubit and maybe we can use these amplifiers for investigating, you know, mini body dynamics within the amplifiers and, and all, all sorts of other uh, exciting quantum measurement things. Okay, um, now I wanna talk a little bit about the impact of dielectric loss because this, as you might expect, because we're ramping up the pump more slowly, the, at the if you're familiar with uh, TUPAs or the effective loss on these systems, it's actually the loss at the very beginning of the device that's most critical. And in this floquet mode tupa, because the gain increases more slowly than in a normal tupa, the, insert, the effect of dielectric loss is, is more severe. So in this, um, this vertical line, I plotted the silicon dioxide loss tangent and the quantum efficiency, including both the sidebands and the dielectric loss. And we find that the floquet mode tupa actually performs worse than any of the other schemes. But then as you increase, as you reduce the dielectric loss, you find that um, the performance, you know, rather quickly, even with an order of magnitude reduction below silicon dioxide, you can get, um, you know, near, near ideal quantum efficiency. And also this, this type of um, drive scheme should also be broadly applicable to other traveling wave pair amps, like, like kinetic inductance traveling wave pair amps. I think it's probably not necessary in optical frequency pair amps because the, the nonlinearity in these is just so incredibly tiny compared to these J tupas. In those cases, you perform the amplification over, you know, at a minimum, it's thousands of wavelengths. In reality, it's probably uh, 
anywhere from like 10 centimeters to meters to kilometers of optical fiber, um, which is, you know, at a, at a wavelength ranging from 500 nanometers to a, a micron, it's a huge number of wavelengths. Whereas in a JTUPA, there are only tens of wavelengths long. So your nonlinearity is massive. And if you remember this curve, we saw that the, the floquet modes, as you increase the nonlinearity, you, you, only then do you start to get this, um, these other sideband contributions. So I think while this is probably applicable to optics, it's probably completely negligible. Can okay. I ask a question on this? Yeah, uh, go ahead. So if one imagines this kind of two-level system business, right, where you want to saturate them with power, so on and so forth, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, if I would imagine the power scale that's necessary to saturate a TLS is probably a lot lower than the pump power you need uh, to feel nonlinearity in your amplifier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you take your uh, sort of this, this modulated amplitude for the pump and just offset it, give it a little mm -hmm. bit more power, Right, so that in fact uh, you have the whole thing offset and maybe bring the top down. Maybe you can saturate some of these two-level systems without actually bringing the device into nonlinearity. Oh, I, I wasn't even considering saturation. I was, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not considering saturation at all. I am considering the fact that um, you're, when you have a small signal amplitude, the impact of any uh, insertion loss is, is less. But I, I do, I completely take your point that probably there might be some scheme that you could do that would rapidly increase the gain at the beginning, like maybe some sort of diabetic, counter diabetic drive. Um, I don't know. I think it's a, it's definitely something we're looking into, but um, we're yeah, not, we're in, not sure. In real devices, the loss is power dependent. Right? And that's sort of non-trivial. And, and it's sometimes you, you can win depending on if you're driving it hard but you will have sort of high losses, you know, at the beginning and ends of the devices because you're not driving it so hard. But I yeah. think given the right power skills, you could probably add just a little bit of power, right? To saturate the two level systems, but not affect the nonlinearity of your amplifier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, in, in, I think in the perfect theory, this would only work when, if you had like zero pump power at the start of the device. But even in these calculations, we're only reducing the pump power by say an order of magnitude. So relative to the, uh, peak of the device. Um, so I think probably it's, we, we will see this effect that yeah, you so mentioned. Yeah, so on that point, before I go to Frankenstein, if you look at the end, you're saying that if it works perfectly at zero, if you had like, you know, 0.1 or 0 0.01, you know, does it still work or how bad is it? That's sort of yeah. the question. <laughs> yeah, I think this this is basically point, I think this is, I, I don't I don't remember the exact value, but this isn't starting at zero and it still works fine. Frank Indeed, when we actually make this, we aren't going to reduce the pump power at all. We're just going to reduce the or increase the the junction critical current mm. on the beginning and, and and end of the device. So it'll reduce the nonlinearity but keep the pump power constant. Yeah, that's so interesting. Hopefully. It may still saturate the defects. That might be a very clever way to do it. Yeah, yeah, I, I hope so. And it's just you know it's you can't reduce the pump power because it's all in a single line. So unless you move right. to flux pumping or some external pump line, it's just not possible to change it. Frank, you're saying. Does the noise matter across the whole uh, gain bandwidth, or does it matter at the signal frequency or the pump frequency or, or all of the above? Um, it matters at the signal frequency. Prime. It matters at the signal frequency and any sidebands that the signal is coupled to. Yeah. One more curiosity question. So yeah. if TLS effects are so strong, I mean, it's. I think it sounds like another Chi-3 effect. So could you... Could you make an amplifier um, based on? Um, actually, Kevin, it's like power, power dependent, such uh, power dependent loss, right? That also counts. Yeah. That so, so like um, you should look at the uh, Kevin Osborne at the Laboratory for Physical Sciences. His group has published a a work in which they're actually able to use these TLSs as a laser uh, because they're you know they're multi level systems. We call them TLSs, but of course they're actually you know they have a complicated level structure. And he found that by uh, having a pump and uh, frequency rapidly frequency tuning uh, the pump, they're actually able to drive these TLSs and get population inversion and use it as a laser. And you know this might be a promising amplifier architecture as as well. Um, I, I forget the material they use. I think it's some sort of intentionally what what qubit people would consider a very bad dielectric. It makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Um, 
I think we've been having, you know, maybe too much fun with amplifiers. So I'll probably have to go relatively quickly through the, the next part. But I want to briefly share a proposal for a, using this traveling wave scheme to uh, these traveling wave schemes to create a, a broadband superconducting um, isolator. So there have been oh, there's a lot of interest in replacing these um, these these large bulky magnetic circulators and isolators um, that I showed you in that previous uh, picture with something that's integrated in, and on chip. And so far, there have been a number of proposals and experiments, but none have demonstrated something that people really use in the field now, and none have demonstrated experimentally a broad uh, a broadband device. For example, multiple gigahertz at a gigahertz center frequency. But parametric processes, they have potential because they're inherently non-reciprocal due to the, uh, the pump propagation direction and the phase matching in this. And actually, there, there have been some works like uh, by uh, Leonardo Renzani from uh, Conrad Leonard's group where they demonstrated uh, narrow band isolation using frequency conversion in a, uh, in a short traveling wave device. But just using frequency conversion it, it turns out not to be an attractive scheme because you get cascaded nonlinear processes and you have to use a um, frequency filter rather than uh, to, to separate the, the different frequencies. Um, and a, a better scheme is to use uh, both frequency and mode conversion where you have your signal, your pump, and your idler in spatially separated modes. And this has an additional advantage that you don't get uh, repeated conversion. Uh, you don't get cascaded conversion processes like, like we were seeing in the uh, J2 button. So there was a scheme that was um, that was published by uh, you and Sean Wei Fan at, at Stanford, um, and they called it, um, and, and it's, it's basically a frequency conversion process where you have two modes, mode A and mode B, and you send in your pump to uh, convert between mode A and mode B um, in one direction, it's phase matched. For example, the K vector of the pump, it, it connects the two bands that you're considering um, in the forward direction, but not in the backward direction. And this is a promising scheme because it gives you this directionality, but it's not promising in terms of the bandwidth. It, it's intrinsically narrow band because your pump can only phase match the uh, conversion at a single frequency. Whereas um, we have this idea for applying a, um, applying a technique that was uh, first developed in nonlinear optics uh, by Haim Suchowski uh, called adiabatic frequency conversion, where you sweep the phase mismatch as a function of position. And by doing this, you get the same dynamics. You get a, a Landau-Zener transition between the two. And um, this is the same dynamics as rapid adiabatic passage. And this is uh, if you if you looked at this in terms of qubits, um, this is something that's uh, insensitive to the uh, to the detuning from the qubit frequency, and this leads to um, a a conversion over a broad uh, frequency of signal and uh, input signals. And in this, we have a we have a, a, a fixed pump k vector, and in this case, we have a um, spatially varying pump k vector. So um, we're proposing this superconducting circuit uh, implementation of this idea where we have two coupled uh, transmission lines with, um, with the, the inductors being uh, squids coupled via a capacitor. And then these are flux pumped by an external uh, flux line. And here we draw this flux line kind of bending away from the, um, the the device because we want the flux pump to be stronger near the center than at the end uh, so that we start out in an eigenstate of the, the system. And um, you can you know, analyze this, this system in terms of two orthogonal even and odd modes. And these even and odd modes are coupled by a, a, the modulation induced by the pump. And um, just in the interest of time, I won't go into this in too much more detail, but when we implement this phase mismatch sweep from the beginning to the end of the device, uh, we see that we're able to achieve, uh, you know, our calculated isolation performance is far better than 20 dB isolation over a four to eight gigahertz band. 
um, relative to a similar device that where we're not sweeping the phase mismatch, which would only achieve a 200 megahertz bandwidth. So this is something that we're actively trying to implement with, uh, with Lincoln. And we think it's a promising strategy for, um, for broadband isolation in, in circuit QED. And for a typical uh, qubit process, the insertion loss is basically uh, negligible order of magnitude smaller than um, a commercial circulator isolator. And as you increase the device length, you can get broader bandwidth. The caveat is, of course, you know, no one's demonstrated traveling wave devices with a loss comparable to a qubit process, um, a loss tangent of like 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 6. So you know, I, I think fabricating this will be you know, potentially challenging, but um, you know, let's, let's, see where, let's see where we're able to land in terms of the material science. I think in terms of the physics, this, this has a lot of promise in terms of being a broadband uh, isolator for circuit QED. Okay, are there any questions on this device before I uh, shift over to the, uh, the last topic and a quick demo? We're waiting for the demo. Okay, waiting for the demo. Sure. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, purely nonlinear couplers. So normally when you, you implement the James Cummings Hamiltonian, it's an approximate Hamiltonian. It's only valid in the dispersive limit. You get the term that you want, this, this cross current interaction, but it 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 has a it has some some issues. It has some issues like it causes it's perturbative, it's weak, this approximation can break down, it leads to things like Purcell decay. And what we'd ideally want is the um, the 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 photon portion of the Hamiltonian, the qubit portion of the Hamiltonian, and a purely nonlinear coupling without all of this um, rotating wave rotating wave nonsense. And we can actually do this with something called a quarton, which is a, a qubit with a purely quartic potential. And this can be uh, generated um, by by creating a, a flux qubit in which you uh, the ratio between this junction, the, the EJ of this junction, and the EJ of these two junctions is one half, and then biasing that this at half uh, flux quantum. And if we do this, then we find that, um, well, we, we found it, and we found that other people had also found that this device has a purely quartic potential. So it's, a, it's an oscillator, but it doesn't behave like a harmonic oscillator because the potential, the, the, the force increases um, the u, u increases uh, quartically instead of quadratically. So I want to spotlight. We, uh, okay, I'm going to keep talking and hopefully it stays on this video. And I want to show you the difference between a quadratic and a quartic potential. So this is actually a real background. Um, so this mode of the spring, it has this normal harmonic oscillator behavior, whereas this mode of the spring, it has, it behaves as if it's a quartic potential. And what you should see is it moves very rapidly and uniformly through the central region. And then it's like hitting a, oops, it's like hitting a, a solid wall on the edge because this force is increasing faster. Sorry, it's not super easy to do over Zoom, but hopefully you can see this, this difference between the behaviors. Okay, so it's not a, a superconducting circuit experiment, but uh, it'll have to do for, for tonight. Um, okay, let's go back to the PDF. And by changing these parameters, you can, um, you can think of, this is a good parameter space to look at all of the uh, superconducting uh, Chi-3 devices, where, you know, depending on this flux bias, you can create, uh, and depending on this, um, ratio of these, these uh, junction uh, EJs, you can create anything ranging from a, uh, a, negative, um, a negative inductance with a, a positive curve to, a, um, to something that's completely linear. And yeah, uh, so we're gonna use this quarton for, for a coupling. And the model you can make for this and you know, sorry, this was a little too complicated to make with actual springs and, and masses, but my student did put together a way to, to actually make this quarton coupler um, out of springs and, and masses. Um, so we're using this quarton in between two regular transmon qubits. And this behaves like a nonlinear quartic spring coupling two 
nonlinear uh, springs that have both a quadratic and a quartic potential. But the key thing is that this quarton has an opposite sign of the quartic potential um, relative to the, the JJ. And this, this allows us to do a lot of exciting things, like canceling off the nonlinearity of the transmon. And, uh, and, and then if you cancel off the nonlinearity of the transmon, that means you just have a photon, like a photon in a resonator, coupled to another photon in a resonator through this, this potentially really strong cross-current interaction through a purely nonlinear coupling. Um, and we think there are a lot of really cool applications to, to this. Um, and this is something that the other uh, uh, nonlinear couplers cannot do. And you know, maybe, maybe it's also useful for, for things in addition, like readout and gates in addition to just being cool physics. Um, so because it doesn't have any of this, this linear energy, um, you're able to get really strong nonlinear couplings out of this, like more than a gigahertz of cross curve um, for qubits at uh, frequencies of say five gigahertz. And this has applications in things like photon detectors where you wanna use one photon to interact with another one. Um, like in this uh, paper uh, led by, Alex uh, by uh, Arne uh, Gernsmo along with uh, colleagues at Berkeley and, and, and Sherbrooke. And this is a device in which you can uh, detect a single, a single photon in the photon number basis using a, a kind of circuit QED uh, readout resonator style dispersive measurement. But uh, we found that using these quartons leads to a, a really efficient measurement scheme. And an example, an analogy I like to give is, I don't know if all of you have seen these highly nonlinear photonic crystal fibers where you, you send in a laser beam and you get a rainbow out the other side. This is as if we have two of these highly nonlinear photonic crystal fibers. We put some coupler in between. I send the laser in one. You get a completely linear interaction in the other, and then a rainbow shoots out the, the other one of these fibers. So I think it, it, it has a lot of cool potential. OK, with that, um, I want to conclude the talk. Uh, can an amplifier ever achieve ideal quantum efficiency? A broadband amplifier ever achieve it? Yeah, we, we think so. And we're working on making this, we propose this isolator or circulator with octave bandwidth. And we looked at this purely nonlinear coupling with giant cross curve. And the last of which is on archive if you want to check it out. And the, the first two will be soon. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the research group, our collaborators at Lincoln, and the Engineering Quantum Systems Group, uh, sponsors the MIT CQE, LPS, DOE, and, and Amazon. Um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to questions if, there are time, if there's time. Let's thank our speaker for a great talk. Thank you, Kevin. We are a little bit over time, so we'll, we'll keep the questions short. Uh, uh, questions for Kevin? I have one question to start, I think, very quickly. So you showed this uh, in this Floquet-driven state. There is this saddle node bifurcation that you have there. Uh, does that worry you in terms of any kind of noise effects, et cetera? So I, I think what this is, is this is giving you the standard amplifier. Uh, this is giving the, you the standard mixing of the signal and idler um, mm -hmm. because you only see the saddle point bifurcation in the signal and idler. You don't see it for any of the other modes if you keep the if you keep the phase matching uh, ideal. So you only so see I, it. Yeah, yeah. You only see it for the the signal the the primary signal in the the idler mode, and I think that's giving you the fact that um, you know you you can't get below the quantum limit. I think if you avoided this somehow, uh, you'd be able to break quantum mechanics. Yeah. No, I was worried about another mode because if you start start to mix noise in a higher order or chaotic processes, that's uh, tricky. Exactly. Yeah, and if you don't if you don't do this scheme right, like if you if you don't correct the the phase mismatch along the device, you actually do see bifurcations in these other um, in these other processes. Cool. Good. Other questions for Kevin? I, I have a question. Uh, so at at some point, so thank you for the great talk. Uh, really oh, thanks, Al. Uh, I have a question. So at some point you mentioned isolation and circulator, but I think I always see a scheme for isolation, right? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I was so, wondering if you had ID for circulator. Yeah, so this 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 circuit is, um, you know, it didn't go into it in a, a huge detail. Hopefully you'll be able to see it in more detail soon, but it converts between an even and odd mode of this coupled transmission line. So essentially it'll do the, the one-way conversion and you can choose whatever you want to do with this even and odd mode. 
If you want to make an isolator, you can dump it into a 50 ohm termination. If you want to make a circulator, you can break out both the even and odd mode using, I think it's pronounced Balin or Balin. Um, you, can, you can break these out um, and, and access them uh, however you want. But you will amplify, right? You will always amplify by going through it. Uh, no, no, this, that's, the, no, no, that's this... the key thing. This, this isolator doesn't do any amplification. If you were doing amplification, that requires you to add some quantum mechanics will require you to add some noise to this. And you know, I think there, there is value to something that amplifies and is a unidirectional amplifier. And this is sort of the, the dream which I think a tupa can achieve once it's very well impedance matched, but that's a, it's a whole different device. And I think there are a lot of uh, applications for things that just isolate or, or, or circulate. Okay, okay, I got you. I didn't get everything the first time. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. And you got a magnetic field to this, right? That's shown in the, the, the green and red. Um, so you have to you have to add a flux pump. Yeah. But there. Um, oh yes, sorry, absolutely right. There there is a global magnetic field bias from this um, uh, this line, this purple line going in the middle. Yeah, you need some negative thing in your Ansager relation, right? To break exactly. Time. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Other questions for Kevin? Hi, I have a question. Yes, um, so you mentioned that you didn't want to talk about disorder, but I was wondering how disorder plays a role in these uh, these devices, and how much how much can you tolerate? Uh, and also, does does these like is your floquet technique is that more susceptible to noise or less susceptible than a standard? Um, so yeah, these these techniques. So I would say we haven't looked at how the floquet mode changes with disorder. So what we're, we've done a pretty extensive studies of disorder in the, the conventional scheme. Um, we just literally haven't gotten to studying disorder in the floquet mode scheme. So it's not, you know, nothing, nothing sinister in me saying we haven't studied it. Um, but conventional tupas are, are fairly robust to disorder. You can tolerate, I would say, depending on the parameter, let me go to this. Let me go to this one. So depending on the parameter set that you choose for the JTUPA, this dispersion feature that you use for phase matching, this is the thing that's most sensitive to disorder. Um, and depending on how strongly you couple this to the transmission line, it will create a wider dip in the dispersion, in the transmission line. And this will make it less sensitive to disorder. And, but the disadvantage is you'll have a larger region where the, the device cannot provide gain. So we can find with Monte Carlo simulations that up to 5% disorder in the capacitance or the inductance um, is, is tolerable and you can make a reasonably performing device uh, out of this. Um, and for the floquet mode scheme, there we're gonna have to vary the device parameters as a function of position. Um, I, I'm not sure how, how robust the disorder that this will be. Okay, thank you. All right, so one, I'm oh, sorry. This is kind of super related to what you discussed, but I'm just curious. So what is the fundamental limit to noise temperature in hemp? Like, is there a frontier to push there? Can, you know, I know it's kind of limited to 2K or so typically. Oh, I mean, I would say, A, I don't know. Uh, okay. There's a really cool paper from Austin, Austin Minix group at Caltech that goes into some of the, the fundamental issues with noise temperature in hemp. And it's actually related to heat dissipation in the, the channel and how, um, as you know, the cryogenic experts here know, as you decrease the temperature, the ability to phonons to dissipate heat, it, it drops like a, like a stone. So I think this is, this is sort of the fundamental issue. I know that there are people working on better hemps, but this is unfortunately not, not something that I know so much about. Okay, pesky phonons. So. Yeah, I think, um, Thomas, Thomas Palacios at MIT is, is working on uh, seeing if they can get quantum limited uh, hence. All right, very good. So I suggest we thank Kevin again for a great talk. We enjoyed the talk and the question and answer. And I wish you a good afternoon, uh, uh, Kevin, on your, on your coast and stay safe, everybody on our side. See you at the next colloquium. Take care, everyone. Thanks for having me. Okay, bye-bye.